And uh, I love this lesson. We're going to talk about seraphim. So this is one of those chances that we get to really look into a particular genre or type of angel, even though a seraphim is never actually called an angel. Um, it's called the burning ones. And you'll see in a moment, but they are a part of the heavenly creatures that are listed in heaven. And so we would classify them as angels for the sake of understanding. So we're going to go back into this lesson. Uh, or we're going to start in lesson five. And we will be looking at three verses of scripture. If you want to go ahead and find those, we will be in Ezekiel chapter one. We'll also be in Isaiah chapter 6, and then we're going to go to Revelation chapter 4. And those are the three passages of Scripture that actually give you physical descriptions of seraphim and all three of those passages. So we'll go there together. All right, now when we go into this lesson on, on seraphim, one of the things that, that I need to explain before we get into that is the difference in seraphim and cherubim. Because... A lot of people use these terms interchangeably because you're going to see cherubim in the Bible described looking like seraphim. But there's an inconsistency in all of the descriptions of cherubim, and there's a reason why. The word cherubim actually is a Hebrew word, cherub, and I want you to see this so you can understand the word, the word, the word cherub in, in Hebrew, cherub in Hebrew, is literally uh, means imaginary figure. Now that's important to understand because the Bible is not imaginary. Why would we have a fantasy figure, an imaginary figure in the Bible? But that's what that word actually means. And so it's important to understand what they're trying to tell us every time they use the word cherub, which is one, cherubim, more than one. So it's the plural sense of that. So when you look at the word cherubim, you're saying, here is something I've never seen before. Here's something I don't know how to describe. Looks like an angel, but I don't know what type of angel. I don't know whether to call this a seraphim. I don't know whether to call this an archangel. I don't know what kind of angel this is because I've never seen a being like this before. Now, interestingly, seraphim is only used a few times, and we're going to look at all the passages where they are described, and they're called seraphim by name, which means, and you'll see this in a moment, it means burning ones. Seraph means to burn. So these are beings who are actually on fire. Their, their skin is burning. They actually have lightning in their skin. And you will see this in a moment as we go through the passage. So their skin looks like boiling bronze and it's got sparks of fire in the skin. Now that's a, that's a seraph, that's a seraphim that we would call them. One seraph, more than one seraphim. So you usually see them in groups together. So we would call them seraphim. So when you see uh, cherub, one, cherubim, more than one, it's an angel that you don't have a description or a name for. You have a description, but you don't have a name. Now interestingly, the word cherub or cherubim is used over a hundred times in the Bible. So it's a very common name. So what happens is you end up um, many times uh, acquainting cherubim with seraphim because of the description that was given to that cherubim. So let me give you a few examples of that. Uh, before we go there, um, you, you know, I don't know how many of you have ever read the Chronicles of Narnia. Have anyone familiar with C.S. Lewis's writings? The Screw Tape Letters and the Chronicles of Narnia and the Lion, the Witch, the Wardrobe, many other writings. Well, C.S. Lewis was really before his time. C.S. Lewis was an incredible uh, Christian writer, but he wrote to persuade unsaved people about the gospel. So he wasn't your typical theologian, even though he was a deep theologian, he didn't write the same way that we see people writing today. He wrote about characters like screw tape. He wrote about the Chronicles of Narnia, where the Chronicles of Narnia has a lion named Aslan who represents Jesus Christ. And even in the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, Aslan dies and, uh, to save uh, the, the characters of Narnia and then raises from the dead. And so you see, this, you see this correlation going on with the gospel. And that was the whole purpose of C.S. Lewis's writings so that he could persuade people 
who didn't believe in the gospel, who would never read the Bible, they would read a story like this and they were getting a gospel message which would open their minds to receive the gospel. But what's interesting is as he writes this, he obviously uses meticulous characters at the right time. A lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So the character for Jesus is this talking lion in the Chronicles of Narnia, in the story or the movie, you can watch either one. But he also uses other, other beings all, through, all throughout this writing, like the centaur. The centaur are horses with their, their uh, human torso from the waist up, and from the waist down, they're the body of a horse. So it almost looks like a man and a horse combined. You've got this, and it, at first, and uh, if you've ever seen the movie, they're some of the most beloved uh, characters in the movie because they're protectors and they're very noble and they're angelic type beings. They're these, uh, there's these supernatural type beings. You also have a character called Fawn. Fawn is, uh, has the uh, feet of a goat, the body of a goat who walks upright with the face of a man. Uh, you also have other types of characters all through his writings. Like you have the, uh, the man-headed bull. It's a bull that walks uprighted, but he's got the face of a man. Now, when you see this in Hollywood or you read it in the Chronicles of Narnia, it, it looks like a fable. It looks like something that's mythical that really uh, you know, would be fictional at best. But in reality, he gets his ideas from Scripture because you're going to see a combination in heaven of human and beast in the same person. When we begin to describe seraphim, you're going to see an ox, you're going to see a, a lion, you're going to see a face of an eagle. These are faces. You're going to see characters in, like seraphim who have the feet of a calf, but the arms of a man. So you see this combination of man and beast in these heavenly creatures, which are the biblical description of these heavenly creatures. So keep in mind that what seems to be like, what seems to be uh, mythological or even uh, fiction uh, in, in one story is actually a reality. But he's kind of played off of that idea. So a lot of times when we relate to God, we relate to God the way we relate to each other. He's my father. So we picture him as this long white beard, the ancient of days with long white hair. And, you know, this and some even put a, a walking cane out beside of him. And so that we can create some type of image that we can relate to. And that's how we see God many times. Uh, even the Bible characters of Noah, you know, they're always these old men that are, and they were old, but you know, sometimes we put them in, in the sense that it, so we can relate to them and they look grand. So we, we make God grandfatherish. And God's this loving grandfather figure, father time figure that we create in our minds so that we can see God. We do the same thing with angels. We make angels these uh, beautiful creatures because we all want to be beautiful when we get to heaven, right? So we make angels these flawless, beautiful Barbie type creatures with wings and halos. But the Bible never mentions a halo on an angel once. We put those there. There are halos in heaven, but they're only worn by saints. It's called the crown of glory that fades not away. It is a band of light around someone's head, but it's never worn by an angel. It's only worn by a saint. So we put halos on their heads and we put wings on their back and we dress them in white and gold and we make them these illuminating, gorgeous, beautiful creatures, perfect in all their ways. Until you get into the teachings of cherubim and you get into teachings of cherubim, and you realize they don't look a thing like that. At least these genres of angels don't look a thing like that. One of the problems that, that we run into, even when we start looking at cherubim, is you will see teachings like Ezekiel 10, where the cherubim have four faces, but then the cherubim in Ezekiel 41 only have two faces. So does a cherubim have two faces? 
or does the cherubim have one face? One of them you will see that his feet look like burning fire. The other one, his feet looks like a calf's feet, the feet of a cow. So does the cherubim have the feet of a cow or does a cherubim have feet of fire? Thank you so much for supporting our ministry. If this has blessed you, please say a prayer for us. And if you would like to give, we have four ways that you can do that. You can give online at briancutshaw.com or if you're a PayPal user, just PayPal us at Church Trainer. Or you can also give through the mail at P.O. Box 267, Georgetown, Tennessee, 37336. Or if you're a Venmo user, you can Venmo us also at Church Trainer. Thank you and God bless you. And may the Lord multiply your seed. Now back to Hope in the Word. So cherubim basically is describing an angel that we don't have a classification for. We don't have a genre. We don't have a definition, a description. It's a new classification of something that we've never seen before, which obviously when you're writing in the Old Testament, almost every single angel would fall in that category of something that you've never seen before. But there is a particular type of angel called a seraphim that is explicit in scriptures and, is, uh, and we're given a lot of information about them. So we're going to start with Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel 1, it says, Then I looked and behold a whirlwind was coming out of the north. So we know that's where God's throne is, right? In the sides of the north. So a whirlwind coming out of the north, a great cloud with a raging fire engulfing itself. So get this in your head. This fire is engulfing itself. So can you see that? It's billowing. So it's not just a cloud of fire and it's not just a bright glow. This is something that would, you would see in a, in a raging house fire, a raging uh, commercial building on fire, something that is a boiling like a uh, volcano. This is a raging fire that engulfs itself. And brightness was all around it and radiating out of the midst of the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Also from within, okay, so from within, so you see this billowing, engulfing, raging fire engulfing itself and walking out of it are these four living creatures. Wow. And they're not burned because you'll find out in a moment why. So from within it came the likeness of four living creatures and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. There we go again. There's our, there's our previous teaching. They have the likeness of a man. So even though they're burning and they're walking out of fire, they kind of look like a man. All right. The likeness of a man. Each one had four faces. Now there's an angel you probably don't see on a postcard, right? <laughs> Each of them have four faces. Okay. So, um, uh, and they have four wings. Their legs were straight and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves feet. So they're described as having like a cow's foot uh, with a hoof and everything. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. Now you have to understand what that looks like. If you've ever melted metal or been to a place where metal is being melted, then you can see what burning bronze would look like. It, it looks like it's moving. So the skin of these seraph, the skin of these seraphim are, is moving. Now we would have uh, smooth skin, well, kind of, but we would have kind of smooth skin where their skin would be moving. If you can imagine that, their skin is not smooth like ours. Their skin looks like it's like a river flowing. So it, their skin looks like burning bronze. Let's continue on because there's a lot more in this teaching. And the hands of a man were under the wings on their four sides. So get this, they have the hands of a man. So here's regular arms and hands that we can identify with. And each of them had four faces and wings. Their wings touch one another. Their creatures did not turn when they went, but each one went straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man... Okay, so understand this. He mentions it first because that's the one he's looking at. The face of the man is in front of him. Then he tells you what's on the right side. And the face of an ox is on the left side. Now, all this is very important. 
And then the face on the right side is the, is the face of a, of a lion. I see the face of a lion on the right side. Each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and each of the four had the face of an eagle. So this is the only place he has it mentioned is in the back, so that's where the eagle is. So you have the man's face in the front, the eagle's face in the back, the lion's face on the right, and the, the ox face on the, on the left. Uh, thus were their faces, their wings stretched upward, two wings of each touched one another, and two covered their bodies. And so it's interesting that he's not showing them flying here, because they're on the earth. Um, when you see them later, you will see them in heaven, and there's a, another pair of wings that we see. So evidently, either these wings are all folded together to look like only four sets of wings or four wings, or on the earth they appear as having four wings, and in heaven they appear as having six wings. Now, why would that be important? Because if you understand anything about a prophetic numerics, four is the number of the earth, north, south, east, and west. The Bible calls the four corners of the earth, even though the earth doesn't actually have corners. It's a, it's a, it's a reference point that God gives us. But understanding this, that Four is the number of the earth. Six is the number of man. So when you see these beings on the earth, they're with man and they're on the earth. So it's only showing four faces and four wings. When you see the same creatures in heaven, not on earth, they have six wings and four faces, representing mankind on the earth, the number of man and the number of the earth. Okay, so... Each of them went straight forward and they went wherever the Spirit wanted them to go and they did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. Okay, so remember I told you that their skin is burning. Their skin looks like burning bronze. Now it's saying that their skin is like burning coals of fire, like, like, um, I'm losing my place here reading it this way. Like the creatures, their appearance was like the burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright and out of the fire went lightning. Okay, do you get that? Lightning is coming out of their skin. Okay, so these creatures, not the, not the girl, blonde haired girl angel leading the two children across the the, the bridge now. Okay, these creatures have burning skin, boiling bronzy skin, four faces, and they have, uh, and, and they have lightning and fire, fire shooting out of their skin and lightning going back and forth in their skin. And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like flashes of lightning. They ran back and forth. So they weren't taking steps. It says that they did not, they just go, went wherever the Spirit wanted them to go. They would just move. It was like they were gliding forward, backwards. Wherever the Spirit wanted them to go, these four creatures were just moving like that. Now, I want to make some observations about this before we go on to the next description because you're going to see three different descriptions of the same beam and each of those descriptions tells us a little bit more about them. Okay, so in this first one, I want you to notice that they are ascending from a, a raging fire. They are ascending from one. They are walking out of the fire completely unharmed and unburned. I think that if I was going to send the fourth man in the fire, I would send a seraph. <laughs> That's who I would send a seraphim as the fourth man in the fire. So um, they are, their name, seraph, means burning ones. Okay, so seraphim literally means that they are on fire or they are burning. Uh, some things I've already mentioned, like they're coming out of the north where God's throne is. Notice this, that these seraphim are not guardians of God, they're entourage. Big difference. God does not need a guard. He's omnipotent. God does not need a guard. This is throne room protocol. This is respect. So this is the, this is, they're announcing because we don't have time to get into this whole passage. This is, by the way, a great sermon if you could just do the whole, the whole chapter. 
But coming behind them is the one who sits on the throne. So all they're doing is announcing the one coming behind them. They don't say a word here. Now you see them later on saying, holy, holy, holy. But they don't say a word in this. They're just coming before the one who sits on the throne to announce that he's arrived. It's entourage. He's coming and we're here to announce it. Now why would these particular types of angels announce his coming? You'll see this in a moment when we see their function in heaven. So I want you to notice several things about them. I don't have time to teach on worship, but if you've ever heard me teach uh, about the seraphim in worship, then this is very symbolic, the position of their faces. The man is you worshiping by living your life forward. That's faith. We walk by faith. They just live by faith. In other words, we just keep going. Knock down, get up again and keep going. I could preach right there, but I don't have time. But you just get up and keep going. So that's how we worship. We worship as a man forward. We live our life forward. So the first face you see is the face of a man and worship is forward living, forward faith, forward march. Don't give up. Don't stop. Just keep going. Walk out of the valley. Walk out of the battle. Walk out of the storm. Just keep going. That's worship. Um, to the left is the ox. Now, when you see it later, it says a calf. So we know it's a baby ox. It's the same thing. It's just one describes it as a baby ox. The other just says an ox. So we see the calf. Why a calf? The sacrificial animal. So on the left, where God is working and you can't see what he's doing, that's what Job said. When God works on the left, I can't see what he's doing. On the right, that's the right hand of power. That's when I know what God's doing. Boy, I've got faith for that because I know what God's doing. But over here, I don't always know what God's doing, but he's doing something. So the calf is you worshiping in sacrifice. That's the sacrificial animal. The lion on the right, that's you worshiping in battle. That's when you've got your bootstraps on, your sword drawn, you've got word of God in your mouth, and you've got on the shield of faith, and you've got your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, you're ready to go. That's me in my battle. I've got fortitude. I've got girt. I've got, I'm ready to go. That's me. I'm the lion. I'm fighting in battle. I'm aggressive. Over here, I can barely fight, but I'm worshiping in my sacrifice. I'm lifting up weary hands, but I'm worshiping anyway. Over here, I'm lifting up faithful hands because I'm feeling strong and in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then there's the eagle. The eagle's behind me. That's me not allowing myself to worship my successes. The flying eagle is the success of mankind. It's not just an eagle. It's a flying eagle. He's soaring above everything else. He is looking for his next prey, and he's bigger than life. So you have to worship. You thank God for your successes, but you cannot worship your successes or you will cease to worship God. So it's there, but it's behind you. Thank God for what he's done through me, but I'm getting ready for what he's getting ready to do through me. So don't get stuck in your successes or you'll be turned around backwards. All right? So, so this... This angel tells us a lot about that. Now, I want to mention one more thing. Then let's go to the next description. This angel also is described as moving at the speed of lightning. Now, in just a moment, you'll see Isaiah. In the next passage you read, Isaiah says, he flew to me. And it was just that fast. When God sends a seraphim to you, it's at the speed of lightning. I call that the speed of favor. When God blesses you, he doesn't have to wait on it. You don't have to wait on it. A commanded blessing can arrive immediately. Anyone besides me ever been a recipient of the suddenlies of God, where God just turns something around so fast and you didn't think it would ever get turned around and then like overnight it happened. And that's what these angels represent. When they move, when the Spirit tells them to move, they move at lightning speed. Wow. This program is brought to you by the partners of Brian Cutshaw and Church Trainer Ministries. Please help us pray that the Lord will continue to send us more partners 
so we can expand his kingdom around the world.